Here we go. Nope, don't want that. Does this make sense? Yeah, sure, whatever. What? Nah, that's pretty boring. Check, check. I really wanted to shed some light on some incredible tips and feedback that I got from other viewers and other way more advanced CAD designers that showed up in the comments section and were posting tips and feedback and just little nuggets of wisdom that I wanted to make sure and highlight here for others so that it is truly spoken to a broader audience. So without further ado, let's jump into today's video and talk through some of the best feedback I have gotten from you. All right, so first thing I just wanna kinda of get out of the way is you you can tell I now officially have Fusion's dark theme activated in my user interface and I am beyond happy to have this. If this is something you want to activate in your workspace, which you can do even if you're on the free version, the paid version, doesn't matter. I will have those tips later on in the video. So stick around and I will show you how to do that. The first thing I want to talk about is solids, not sketches. Now, what do I mean by this? Doing a lot of things like fillets and chamfers and mirroring and patterning inside of a sketch is a bad practice for a multitude of reasons. One of the big reasons is for things like patterns, it is computationally way more intensive to do that in a sketch. So a general rule of thumb should be that anytime you're trying to do any complex features, especially in 2D, either break those up into multiple sketches to make it a little easier or save a lot of those things like fillets and chamfers and patterns for a solid feature instead. This is kind of the explain it like I'm five years old way that I can wrap my head around this. It's not super intuitive, but in Fusion, it runs something called a solver in the background that actually computes everything you do inside of your sketch. For example, with this pattern, every single line, all of the relations, every part of this sketch definition requires a lot more thinking on Fusion's behalf versus things like 3D components. 3D components you can think of as things that have already been computed and solved and so you're just copy pasting identical results across multiple instances. Now that's my definition of it that I've come to like wrap my own head around. There's probably way better ones from Fusion. If I find anything, I'll link it down below in the description. But to kind of show what I'm talking about, I'll give you a couple examples of things that are a little bit cumbersome doing in a sketch versus doing as a solid. It just is a little bit more of a pain in the butt to have to make modifications to your pattern as a sketch compared to doing it as its own standalone feature in your timeline. So for example, if I need to make changes to this pattern that I've cut into my coaster here, I would have to go back into my sketch and then I would have to zoom in, find this little tiny you know, rectangular pattern uh, symbol called out here, double click it and then make my changes that I need. So the comparison there is if I had done this as a 3D feature instead, I can simply jump down here to the timeline, double click back on that instance of that copying for that geometry and just make my modifications. All of the definition is the same, but it's just way quicker for me to jump down here and make that change versus having to do it inside of my sketch. Another thing that's kind of interesting is if you want to stack features together. If I roll back my timeline here and I decide I do want to chamfer, I can just go back to that parent feature that I referenced on everything. Click modify, chamfer. I'll go ahead and throw that on this top edge here. We'll give it 0.4. That sounds great. You'll notice when I drag back over, I have my chamfer on that parent feature, but it's not on the rest of them. Well, all I have to do is jump back in here, zoom in and command click that feature as well hit OK, and boom, it's scaled across the entire design. I just make those changes to the parent and then they scale as I need them to with my 3D pattern. Don't get me wrong, there are exceptions to this rule as with pretty much everything when it comes to CAD design. There, there are times where you just cannot avoid that. Sometimes when you're doing like a loft or a sweep or you're getting into not surface modeling but more organic shape modeling, sometimes it doesn't always work as simply as what I'm showing here. If you want more resources, I'm gonna link a video from the Autodesk Fusion team that goes over exactly what I'm talking about here, just to kind of help get different perspective on thinking differently when it comes to approaching your design to be more efficient, to be able to scale better when it comes to more and more complex designs. All right, for the next one, exporting as a .3MF file or a .step file, not just a .stl file. Just to back up here, I want to dedicate an entire video to this and then link that to this video. So when I do do that, I'm gonna put that up here in the top right corner for your viewing. For now, I'm gonna just highlight the things that I think are important to know about this. So the first thing that I wanna quickly go over is just how you export. I showed using the print utility 
in one of my previous videos. And that's just by going up to utilities, hitting your 3D print utility tool. This is where it gets interesting. I have always been doing export, then picking the object you actually want to export. And then I was just suggesting using a binary STL format if you want to 3D print something and kind of go on about your merry way. A couple of problems with this. Number one, there is a print utility in Fusion that will link to your slicing software. The last time that I used this, only Cura and like one other type of slicing software was available at the time. And so using print utility largely wasn't beneficial to me when I upgraded to my bamboos. And so I abandoned it and I did not revisit it. And I super regret that now. If you want to just directly inject something into your slicing software, go to print utility. For me, it's going to be bamboo studio. You will select your object. You will hit whatever type of format you want. And again, here you can choose 3MF and STL. You hit OK, and then it will automatically bring up your printing software and you will just have your part immediately in here. That way you don't have to mess with saving it to a different file location, then opening up your slicing software, then going and finding that file then dragging and dropping it or opening it, whatever. All those intermediate steps are, are gone. I did know this existed, but I'm being honest, I wasn't able to use it anymore at the time. And this was years ago. And now it is perfectly integrated with Bamboo and it is absolutely going to be the way I do this moving forward. Another thing someone brought up that just makes a ton of sense, instead of having to go up to my print utility and clicking on 3D print and going through all this different stuff, say I'm just hanging out in the solid modeling tab still, I can just go find my part in the browser. I can right click, I can hit save as mesh, and it pulls up the exact same menu we were just looking at. It honestly feels a lot faster to just go over and you can you know, click the whole top level part if you want to, or if you wanna go find the body that you care about, you right click that one, save as mesh, go for it. Honestly, uh, I didn't know that existed either. So thank you so much for posting that. That is, and I just love shortcuts. You guys know I love trying to put out shortcuts. So that one's great. Just right click, jump straight to the menu that you care about, and then you export it. Now, step files. This is where it just gets kind of different slash weird, but not so bad. So I'm going to click on this body. I'm going to come up here to file and I'm going to click on export. This is only different specifically for step. You can use the utility for the 3MF and the .stl. But when I get here, this is where I have a drop down menu where I can pick any of these different file types and export. And again, this works for STL. It works for 3MF. It's fine, but you have to do this to get to your step file. I select step. I'm going to put it in my downloads folder. I'm going to hit export and we're done quick and dirty. Those are the ways that you can get stuff exported. Uh, a little bit more officially. And those are the different types you can pick from. I'm going to give you just like my really quick 30,000 foot view on how these different file types can actually impact you. To me, the easiest way to make this comparison is inside of my slicer, uh, because again, we're talking about 3D printing these parts. And inside of my slicer here, you'll see I have three of the same part. They are the exact same part that came from the CAD. There is no different modifications between them. They were just exported differently. So looking at this, we have my STL file here on the left. You can see body.stl. In the middle, I have .3MF. It just came in with a generic object name. And then on the right, I've got my step file. Now, at first glance, there's really not much difference here to look at. And you're essentially correct. First thing I wanna point out is the difference between an STL and a 3MF. You'll notice when you export both of those, your CAD software is actually going to mesh those before they get here. And that's what you need before you can 3D print something is you have to take it from a fully defined vector CAD file into something that's meshed. So it's consumable by your 3D printer. You'll notice here, this corner is kind of like a really easy vantage point for comparison. The two meshed to to essentially the same quality. They have the same parameters. The big difference is one file size is a little bit smaller than the other. And the 3MF file actually can pack in a lot more features. Long story short, it's a more efficient way to export a file. It does all the same things that you cared about with your STL file, but it can also give you additional features and free up some storage space when you're actually exporting these and keeping them. Over here, we'll compare the 3MF to the step file. You'll notice right away when you zoom in on these two things, the step file has a lot higher mesh quality than the 3MF file does. And you might be wondering, well, why? How is that possible? Well, when I exported the step file, it gave me 100% of the model's accuracy in a vector file format. What then needs to still happen, like I mentioned, is you have to mesh this body 
before you can 3D print it. I had to do an intermediate step to get here. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete this step file and I'm gonna go up here to add. I'm going to select that same step file, bring it in and you'll notice what's really cool about this with bamboo specifically is that I can define how granular of detail I want by sliding these two linear and angle deflection slider bars to define it. You can change these up and down, so left and right, and that will give you tighter and tighter triangles in your mesh. There is a bit of give and get here when it comes to computational efficiency, but for the most part, if it's smaller parts or not super complicated parts, that is okay. And you can toggle that and play with that to get to a higher quality part that you can 3D print and eliminate a lot of these little tiny lines that you see coming up on some of your parts that were meshed generically in a lot of CAD software. So for this, I'm just gonna hit okay and boom, we are imported and again, I slid my bars down to give me a little bit higher resolution and look at this. Before slicing, it looks very, very clean. As you can see, it's nearly smooth on the face of these, but after I slice it, the machine still has to do some of its own computation to make this as applicable as possible. So there is some parts of the meshing that you just can't get away with. And my, I'm not fully concluded here on this, but it seems like bamboo can sort of tell when you're asking a little bit too much of it. But just at first glance, it looks like it's doing a slightly better job in the slicing, just from like a, a far away vantage point maybe just about the same because I asked for way too much quality that is something that you can toggle with a step file to try and get a little bit better part accuracy out of whatever you're trying to make both are worth considering step files tend to be a lot higher in file size whereas 3mf is kind of on the lowest end of the spectrum here SDL still works fine if everything that I just said just seems like it's getting a little too into the weeds that's okay I would say you know, if I had to pick one of these moving forward for 3D printing, I'd probably start going with 3MFs if you're generating files. But if you're just pulling files, don't look at an STL on the web and be like, oh no, that's not a good file to use anymore. It's that I don't think that's the case. 3MF is becoming a more and more popular solution. And please comment below. There's a lot more people that know way more about this. So please inject those comments and, you know, stuff that sticks out. I'll make sure to add some research into my upcoming video for. This is everything in a nutshell that I just wanted to push out for this quick piece of the segment. So going through all these tips really reminded me how important it is to keep investing time into learning your craft and sharpening your skills regularly. Personally, I get a ton of joy out of exploring new fusion and CAD design topics just to see what I've missed and getting in those valuable reps with tools that I haven't used much before. And that's actually a perfect segue to today's sponsor, which is Brilliant, a fantastic app that helps you level up your thinking through hands-on visual problem solving. If you're into engineering design the way that I am, you know how important it is to think clearly and solve problems creatively, and that's where Brilliant comes in. It's packed with thousands of visual hands-on lessons that help make complex topics like math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI just sort of click. Just like mastering CAD starts with the basics of things like sketching, constraints, clean design habits, Brilliant helps you build a strong foundation first, then gradually challenges you with deeper, more advanced problems. It's a smart way to stay sharp, actually make progress toward your learning goals. I actually love how brilliant scientific thinking course sharpens the way you approach problems just like an engineer. It's packed with interactive lessons on circuits, gear systems, physical structures, and more, all designed to build your intuition through visual problem solving. It's not just theory, it's the kind of thinking that actually helps you think critically with your designs. If you're interested in trying everything Brilliant has to offer free for 30 days, please visit brilliant.org slash writings, or you can just click on the link that I have down in the description. More importantly, Brilliant is offering an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription if you follow my custom links as well. And now let's dive back into a few more important tips for Fusion. Okay, this one's going to be short and sweet, but someone brought this up and it was too hilarious not to share because it's happened to me before. Previously in my sketch tool video, I was saying using the escape hotkey to get you out of operations. I think I went too far by just saying it'll get you out of all operations. Totally not true. And I know this, and I think I was just being irresponsible with the phrasing that I was saying there. So I'm... <laughs> Very happy that this comment popped up and it was hilarious when it did. Escape key will not work with the spline tool, okay? And this can be extremely frustrating because not only does it not work to stop using the spline tool, it will cancel out everything you were just doing. Okay, so to show you what I'm talking about, come up here to your spline tool. I'm inside of a sketch. We'll click on spline. I'm gonna start from the center point. Boop, 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 boop. 
okay, at this point, I'm like, okay, you know, I don't want to connect it. I just want to have this free flowing line. Maybe I'm going to sweep across it. Maybe I'm just going to do something, you know, more parametric here in a second. And I want to get away from this. If I hit the escape key, it all goes away. It does not just stop kind of like with a line tool where if I click on line tool and I come over here and I go up and then I go over and I'm like, okay, maybe I'm done. If I hit escape with line tool, it stops at my last point that I set the line at. Same does not apply for the spline. So if you are using spline, please, please, please just hit your check mark, call it a day. Don't let it hurt you like it has hurt me and many others in the past. Okay, next tip. This one is fantastic. Uh, using the break tool and construction line tool instead of trimming. Now I had a couple of comments come up asking about, wouldn't it be nice if you could just trim and like leave behind a construction line or, you know, trimming gets rid of references and things that maybe I still care about. I don't necessarily just want to kill them all together. And a lot of people were just like, dude, trimming is just killing a lot of stuff that is unnecessary. Like for my extrude example, it just was wasted time, which all of that is valid. I, I totally agree to take some very incredible advice from those comments. I actually learned something that I feel like is better than trim tool. I think I would rather go this direction of breaking and then turning something in construction rather than trimming. So I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay. I made this kind of nifty little simple part where I just drew a rectangle that kind of has like some length and width that I care about. And I wanted a little cutout inside of it. In one of my previous videos, I was talking about using the trim tool. So if I hit the letter T, I can pop that up and say, I want to get rid of this line and this line because they don't serve purpose inside of my sketch for some reason, then I would just left click on each of these after they get highlighted purple and I could cut them out. Trimming in that way is like a kind of quick and dirty way to undo certain sketch features that you may not care about. Now, what if the opposite is true where you still want them as features, you just want to not bog down a lot of your sketch or you wanna keep references that are important for you for later on? Well, that is where the break tool and using a construction line kind of comes to the rescue. So if I undo what I just did, control Z, control Z, I want to remove this line from the rest of this body and this line from the rest of this body. I don't wanna get rid of it and I wanna turn into a construction line instead. Well, here's how you do it. Step one, we're going to hit S to bring up my search shortcut and I'm going to type in break, click on break. And now watch what happens when I hover over this, I actually get a little red X that pops up down here at this point. I'm going to left click that and look, now I have two independent lines that are joined at this point instead of having one continuous one that's joined together. Do the same up here when I hover over this one, notice the little red X pops up. So I'm just going to left click that. And now I have split these two lines as well. Well, now here's the kicker. If I click on that line, I can either come over here to line type and turn it into construction, or as someone called out, use your hotkeys. After you've selected it, you can hit the letter X on your keyboard and it turns it into a construction line. And if you wanna go backwards, just click it again and X again will turn it back into a normal line. So X is how you toggle on and off your construction. I'll do that to both and boom, everybody wins here because I get the shape of the part that I'm actually trying to make. But say out here in this corner distance, I wanna maintain this point to show relation between this face and this face and it will it will keep it if I need to reference it later. So really cool uh, break plus X, in my opinion, is probably typically gonna be better than your trim tool in a lot of use cases. So something to consider if you're okay with keeping a little bit of model data that may serve you later on as references. Okay, final part. Sorry if I'm blinding your eyes now after I promised that I wouldn't, but we're gonna go through getting you into the new dark theme for Fusion. And you can use this with the free version. You do not need the commercial version of Fusion. So let's jump into it. What you wanna do is come up here to your little icon, left click that, then come down here to preferences, left click on that. Preview features, and you wanna scroll down and click this checkbox for enable UI themes. I'm gonna hit apply. You might get a dialog dialog box that pops up saying, are you sure you want to do this? You just click yes. Then what you want to do is hit okay to get out of your preferences so they can reset real quick. Back to preferences, go to general. And now you've got this little theme drop down here. And what you want to do is click on that, go to dark blue, hit apply. Boom. We are in the new dark blue or the dark theme that Fusion has 
in its beta mode for user interface. I haven't noticed anything terrible yet, but I think they're going through a lot of development to get this up to speed and make it more user friendly. So use it at your own risk. But in my personal opinion right now, it's been really friendly. And again, it I love it because it's kinder on your eyes instead of having this blaring white background or having to kind of like manipulate into weird gray or special environments underneath your grid and everything. This is just much more pleasant and well packaged, I think. So kudos Fusion. And there you have it. There's how you get yourself into the new dark theme for fusion thank you guys for sticking around and watching this video if you want some more fusion tips or just other refreshers with fusion click on the following videos that i have popping up on the screen right now thanks y'all